Welcome to this exciting bar chart educational webinar on the tactical applications of using the Commitment of Traders report. If you're a futures trader or an equities trader, the COT report can provide an invaluable insight into market trends, potential price movements, and market sentiment. Now, today I'm thrilled to have a special guest, Don Dawson, futures market analyst and bar chart contributor, to share some of his trading insights and strategies on how to leverage the COT report. Now, whether you're a beginner or an experienced trader, this session is going to be packed with valuable information that can help you stay on top of markets. So stick around as we dive into the world of the COT report and explore the key tactics for using them to make more informed trading decisions. Hello everyone, my name is John Rowland, Bar Chart Senior Market Strategist. And as I mentioned in the opening, today's webinar is a little bit different from our usual sessions. Today we have a very knowledgeable guest, Don Dawson. But before we bring Don on, please welcome my partner and our moderator, Bar Charts Project Director, Gene Baker. Hello, Gene. Good afternoon, everyone. How's everybody doing? Ready for this oh, session? Great. I'm very excited about today's session. Yeah, so am I. So you can go ahead and uh, get Just right into right introducing into your special guest. Yeah, because we're, we're right, happy, to, happy to have this uh, session for everybody and let's get going. Okay. Okay, Gene. Thanks. I just want to remind folks today the session is for educational purposes only and the decisions to buy, sell, hold, or trade securities, commodities, or any other investments involves risk and best made based on advice of a qualified financial professional. Now, futures trading is not for everyone, as we will be mentioning a lot of futures markets. And under no circumstances shall we be liable for any losses or damages that you or anyone incurs as a result of any trading or investment activity that you or anyone engages in based on any information or material you receive through barchart.com and our services. So without further ado, let me, today's guest is a longtime friend of mine with 35 years of trading experience, extensive knowledge about all things futures and one of bar charts Bar chart contributors. So you can find Don's articles under the news Don Dawson page and futures market analyst. So welcome, Mr. Don Dawson. Hello, Don. How you doing, John? Gene, how are you? Good to be here. Well, we're we're excited to have have you here. So as Gene said, let's jump right into it. Uh, I know how much you rely on the data that can be found in the COT report, and I'm really delighted to have you um, get your take as we walk through the COT report today. So let's do this. So for those of you who are not familiar with the COT report is, or the Commitment of Traders report is, it's provided by the CFTC. And the report contains the historical record of futures markets, breaking down the open interest by position types and uh, market participants. Now, position types can include long, shorts, and spread. Now, a spread trader is somebody who's both long and short at the same time. And we're going to leave that for a uh, discussion for another time. And then we have our participant types, and these would include commercials and non-commercials. Now, commercials would be categorized as those companies that or traders that use or produce the underlying commodity, and their main purpose is to hedge or to reduce risk for their day-to-day -day activity. And non-commercials, which would be categorized as uh, traders or firms who are trying to profit from commodity price movement. Now, Don, is this a good assessment of how we categorize these folks? Yes, it, it sure is. And uh, you know, we, when we get ready to look at these uh, commercial entities and then also the non-commercials, uh, which are two different trading styles. You have your commercials who are basically, they make the bottoms and make the tops in your markets. 
And then also the non-commercials, which is like managed money, hedge funds, commodity trading advisors, just examples. And those are trend followers by nature. So it's the trend followers who push prices up to producers to sell, and then they down trends, push prices down for the processors to buy. So the function of the speculator in the market is to provide liquidity for both the selling commercial and the buying commercial. And it's through their trends is how that is done. So when we look at the, the commitment of traders report, why is it important to delineate between these two different uh, types? Now you sent along this slide, so maybe you can explain to that to us. Yeah, the, this slide is very interesting because in the upper right corner, you can see, and let's just sort of say where you get this from, but the Commodity Futures Trading Commission releases this report every Friday afternoon at around uh, 3.30 Eastern time. And when it comes out, you can see there's a lot of data on this sheet. So it becomes almost very overwhelming when you first look at this, if, you, if you're kind of not informed how to read it. But the main thing on this is it, in the black box in the upper right corner it says open interest. And what that means is that's the cumulative open interest for every corn contract. That's the particular market we're looking at here for every one of the corn contracts. So there's 1,319,429 open positions. Now, I, I put this on here because what I like to do in the futures market is point out how important the commercial entity is. And you'll see there's three columns, non-commercial, commercial, and then non-reportable positions, which are not that important. But when you look at non-commercials over there, if we look down under the percent of open interest for each category, what we see is that the managed money or the non-commercials, like 30.8 and 9.4 percent of the total open interest. But when you look down the commercial column, what you see is we have a much bigger position size, 43% of, of commercials have um, I'm sorry, commercials have 43% of the open interest in long positions, and they have 58% in the short positions. So I, I like to point this out that in futures trading, the commercials are the big whales in the water here, not the institutions like everybody thinks. In stock trading, that's institution driven, but in futures, it's really dominated by the commercial entity. So I just wanted to point this out. And over on the far right, non-reportable positions, those are basically small speculators, not necessarily retail, but they're, they're trading under what is called as a reportable position which could be a thousand two thousand contracts so even if you trade 900 contracts in some markets you're still a non-reportable so so don't think of that as just retail size but what we really want to focus on is commercial and non-commercial so what i which is kind of neat about uh bar chart is that slide that don just told you that is the slide of the the cf to c report what bar chart does for us, it does condense all that information and it makes it very digestible. So first of all, let's just kind of re show you where we can find some of this information. First of all, here's our commitment and traders page, which is found under our futures page. And again, um, whoops, by accident there. What we can do is, again, there's a little bit more detail about like what Don just explained. What is an open interest? What is a reportable position? Uh, this difference between commercials and non-commercials and non-reportables. Now, we're going to take a, a little bit of a dive into uh, another type of report, which is called a disaggregate. We have two types of uh, commitment of traders. We have something called a legacy, and we have something that's called a disaggregate. We're going to delineate between uh, those ones as well. And you can see here, you know, in the disaggregated, we're kind of more granulated. We talk about producers, merchants, processors to users and this is our commercials these are the folks that are using futures markets to kind of basically um, hedge their day-to-day -day, uh, economic activity swap dealers uh, we're not going to go with a lot of detail about swap dealers certainly swap dealers can have an effect on our markets but usually they represent folks that either don't want to trade futures markets or have swap positions and then what Don was saying is our money managers are really our trend followers. So when we start to dive deeper into our commitment to traders report, we really want to kind of concentrate on these two categories, producers, merchants, processors, users, and our money managers. And one of the things that we can do then is we'll go back into our bar chart page and here's our legacy report. And the legacy report really does divided into three categories. We're, we're gonna talk about uh, our commercials, our large hedgers, and our non-commercials, our large speculators, but we also have our non-reportables. So again, something that we're not going to pay a lot of detail to. So we also um, 
can look at a very detailed report or a summary report. So let's start with the summary report. And here is kind of just as a big picture. So notice here for wheat, it says that our net, our large commercials, our large hedgers, their net position is 65,054. Now that means that if we looked at all the commercial positions that are out there, we'll have some that are long and some that are short. Notice we have a long positions of 139,000 and a short positions of 74,000 approximately. So if you look at the difference between the two of them, that would be uh, a positive 65,000. In other words, what we're seeing right here as a summary that in the wheat market, large hedgers are net long the market. And what we can also do is look over here and see where that value that net position falls in a 52 week range and that's going to become important to us when we start doing some trend analysis so if i break this down into a detailed report again um we're still in the legacy here notice here we we can see that what bar chart does it takes all that information from the cftd cftc and really kind of really makes it very digestible for us. And some of the things that we're gonna start looking for in the Commitment of Traders report is when we see pri uh, the positions of these large traders, not only our commercial traders, but also our speculated trade speculators, when their positions get to what we call these 52 week highs and lows. Now there is something that we need to understand in terms of what a 52 week high represents or a 52 week low so let me see if i can explain that to you and don uh, jump in uh if you want to say anything here but first of all let's look here we can see on the wheat that we have a this green box which says 52 week high which is telling us that at this point on this report that our large hedgers had the largest open interest position which happens net be long 71,000 right Don that's exactly right and what's interesting about this is typically the wheat market carries a net short position meaning the producers are much more active at their hedging this is a case here that points at the processors of wheat who's going to make flour pastries and everything maybe it's for Easter who knows but there's this a lot of demand from the processors in this and, and this is unusual to see wheat at a, a net long position and when we go a little bit deeper when we did dive into wheat we'll also discover that maybe this might be an indication to us that something greater is about to happen but let's look at our um non-commercials are large speculators and you can see at the same time our our large com non-commercials are large speculators those as don has mentioned are trend followers or who might be driving our trends their position is a negative seventy three thousand. in other words they have the largest 52 week low now this remember your old fifth grade math you know as a negative number gets larger right so this is telling us that this is the lowest negative number we've seen in terms of the largest negative number in other words the largest short position so this is something that it can be different in other markets in terms of negative and positive we'll look at that in a second but again what i just kind of want to reiterate here is that I can look at the legacy report and I can see who, what their net positions of these two large uh, categories and what we want to start looking for is when we get to these extremes, right? Right. And John, a good point to bring on this when we look at some charts here in a little bit is to notice that with this negative 73,000, which is a 52 week low, you're going to say, wow, that the price has really been down for a long time. And that's exactly why, because money managers are trend followers and that's the exact pattern you'll see. And the commercials have been scaling into long positions as price was dropping. Right, so let's do that. Let's go to our chart. And I'm just gonna go right here from the chart. And again, I said to you that on the legacy report, there's really three categories. And you can see here, it says COT cot legacy. And if I click on that, we have our large commercials, our large speculators, and we have our small speculators. 
And so small speculators really don't matter in, in when we do this analysis. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna take them off. We're gonna just turn this off on our chart here. And it's gonna make it a little bit easier for us um, to delineate between our two. So again, so I'm gonna leave it to you, Don, here. You wanna walk us through what we're seeing here? Sure. If you're looking back at the, the red line being your commercials, the green line is going to be your managed money. And if you just look at the patterns on here, that if, if the trends are down, price action is down, you'll see the green line sloping down as well. And then typically the red line will be sloping up as the market goes down. And what that is just telling you is that the uh, managed money is our trend followers and they're pushing prices down, selling, selling, selling. And then it's uh, the commercials, they scale into positions by dollar cost averaging in, into the market. So by the time they, and they're absorbing that demand as it comes, I'm sorry, supply as it comes down. And once they absorb that supply, then the market tends to turn and go up. So, and you can see that the red line is at a high point on that entire chart. I think that's on a three-year window, but if we had a, a one-year on there and you look back to the left, you're, that's like at the highest peak in the last 52 weeks, right? And the green is at the lowest trough in the last 52 weeks, which is pretty significant. So what we're seeing here, again, is what we're seeing is that our money managers are driving this trend lower, but at the same time, as you had mentioned, that our large commercials, our large hedgers are looking at the price of wheat and they're saying, hey, you know, maybe the price of wheat is cheap. Now, what we have to remember is that a commercial is both the user and the producer. So we're not talking about farmers here, as you mentioned, it's just like your biscuit makers. And what we can do is also look at this in terms of a historical basis. And so I'm just gonna shrink up time a little bit here. And what Don is saying to us is you can see that typically for the wheat market, um, that we do see that our large hedgers usually tend to have a short position. And that is probably more about uh, the producers, right? The farmers, right, Don? Correct, yeah, producers, anyone who grows or produces the wheat, or it could even be grain elevators who have inventory that they're hedging. So what we wanna look for is one of the first components in our process is we're gonna start looking at when these positions get to extremes. And so what you can see here in terms of how far these positions are on a historical basis, that there's something very particular about this market that both of these traders have extreme positions. And we're gonna break this down in a second, but I do wanna point out that notice that when we got some other extreme um, in terms of where our large hedges were long was also very close to some bottoming actions, right Don? Correct. Yes. And then you can see that the managed money was very short at the same time because it had been in a downtrend. So you can imagine how the uptrend starts is the short covering has to come in by the managed money, which basically is they're buying back their short positions. And then eventually their trading signals trigger a long, uh, I'm sorry, a uptrend, and then they start buying for new positions. So let's look at another example. So we'll come back to wheat in a second. So the other one I wanted to look at which I noticed, and this is gonna be the opposite. So here we can see our large, we're, going to, we're still in the large speculators and I've gone to the soybean meal and we can see that we're at a 50, we just recently were at, was at a 52 week high. Again, what is this telling us is that our large speculators had the largest long position that they had had in the last year. And if we look at our commercials, we can see at the same time they had the largest short position. So again, if what we've just learned is what can we anticipate when we think about uh, price movement? Well, we know that our money managers have the largest position and that they have been building this large position for quite a period of time. So what we would probably anticipate is we see is that price has been uh, rallying or at least trending uh, to the upside. And so what we see here now is here's our money managers who have been driving this trend for quite some time. And at this point now our, uh, in this case, not our end use, oops, that's strange. Um, let's go back to Neil. That our 
large commercials, not like what we saw in the wheat, which was our, um, you know, our processors. But in this case, probably somebody who is ha physically has the meal, right? Like, right. For for the, like the crushers, for example, you know, they had an inventory. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, so on, and just in, in terms of what meal means, um, you know, this is what they do with the soybean. They crush it and makes two products, oil, soybean oil, which is usually used for human consumption, and then soybean meal, which is usually used as a feedstock for livestock, you know, chickens and hogs and cattle and such, right, buddy? Exactly. So what we can see here now is we are at an extreme uh, wide position in terms of length and shorts between our trend followers and our commercials. And one of our commercials are kind of telling us is that as price was getting up to these levels, they're looking to lock in, as, to, as Don says, lock in or hedge their position. If we look at this in terms of a more relative time frame, a larger picture time frame, what we see is that this price action that created these extreme positions has pushed price into an area that we haven't seen since 2014. And so for at this point, this is really what our commercials are telling us is that those who are creating soybean meal are taking an opportunity to lock in a lot of production costs and that this could be a sign for us that when we start doing other technical analysis that price has gotten too far too fast and that what we could see is a change in our trend right exactly and if you look that was an all-time high back in 2012 when we had it was like the worst drought in 50 years but that's an all-time high on soybean meals so you can see when we get back up to that area the commercials you know they, they made that high back there before if you look underneath of 2012 you'll see they were very short at that time so we know commercials made that high and now we're back up in that same region and here they are short again so they like that area for selling yeah exactly and, and again you know we have a couple other extreme uh, right. divergences in terms of these like, these positions um, and other times and you know the prices aren't as high as they are currently are but they certainly were we saw a change in price action or you know a topping action and you can see that it's, it's repeated okay. over multiple times right yeah, exactly. And you can notice that peak you're on right now, the commercials were selling, but they did not get as extreme as they did on that prior peak that they were shorting. Right. And now we're at the the largest that we've seen, some, like you said, since right. 2018, right? So, as a matter of fact, just to record, the uh, large speculators currently have the largest position in longs since Soybean Meal's been trading. So, talk to us about why is this significant this 52 week high and 52 week low in the difference between what a commercial can do in terms of futures contracts and what a um a money manager can do in terms of futures contracts okay well a commercial i, I like to one year look back or 52 weeks and i what that does that takes in every season throughout the year you got you know your planting season your harvest season uh merchandising part of the year stuff like that so it's a whole calendar year not just a quarter of it or anything like that and the commercials, obviously with crops especially, there's there's always a time of the year where they're planting at consistently at the same time and harvesting at the same time. So the commercials looking at a one year, are, are you can see patterns in those by looking back for a one year pattern. They're gonna be selling rallies and buying the drops. Now manage money, is the same concept except they're not really they're just following trends that's that's their bottom line they're just looking to make money uh following trends managed money is not like some of us who trade uh, they're certainly not day traders <laughs> but but managed money gets into these positions and they hold these things for maybe six to 12 months at a time because think about the transaction cost if they got in on one day and got out of next with the size they trade they'd be huge transaction cost so that's why these trends uh, they stay so long like you notice that green line right there is above the zero line for going all the way back to april of 22 last year that means managed money overall has been net long soybean meal so you see these guys are not just in and out of the market like a lot of smaller traders would be so they have to kind of dig their heels in and build a long-term position what about position limits can you talk about that as well yeah good point the um the exchanges have position limits for all speculators even if you're an institution or whoever you are if you're registered as a speculator the exchange will not let any ent one entity trade no more than a certain number of contracts 
And the purpose of that is, is because somebody with enough money could corner a market. Maybe some of you guys remember the Hunts Brothers from Silver Squeeze, uh, Trading Places movie when they were trying to squeeze orange juice, right? So, but th basically the exchange says you can only trade so many contracts. So when, when these managed monies get to these one year high like this, you gotta start thinking who's left to buy. Right, it, it takes so, like a brand new company to come in to, to keep adding to these positions. So at some point, speculators run out of uh, new buyers to come in. Now, on the other hand, commercials, the exchanges recognize them simply as hedgers. They're not speculating and they're obviously not gonna try and corner a market so they can trade unlimited contracts. So it's almost like going into a boxing ring with one arm behind your back when you're going against these commercials as far as being you know, fair of how many contracts can, you can buy or sell against them. You know, and in my former life, uh, I was a, a large uh, broker for a lot of these commercial traders. And I will let you know that they never are 100% hedge. In other words, they never hedge their total production or their total consumption. That, that usually, the, you know, at the most they maybe get is about 50%. So again, what Don is saying is when we get to these extreme values, the, the, the more they, you push price in one direction, you know, the more it comes, becomes attractive uh, for our commercial traders, especially when we get to these extreme price actions. Right. But as in terms of our trend followers, you know, it's the old adage, you know, if everybody's long and you look around, who who's going to buy it, right? So that mm -hmm. is why we can sort of use this as a warning sign that some change in trend could be uh, on on the way. So that's the legacy report. So I, what I want to do is I want to dive a little bit deeper in this disaggregated report. And I think Don and I will both tell you that we like the disaggregated report because it's really more granulated. Again, there's four categories, our producers, merchants, processors, and users, this would be our commercials, our swap dealers, again, those folks that are, have other transactions. And again, sometimes they um, represent folks that either find futures too risky or, for instance, like a, a large bank might uh, take the opposite side of a position for a utility who wouldn't trade uh, futures markets, let's say, for let's say natural gas or something like that. And then our money managers and their non-reportables. So let's look at the desegregated report and see if we can see, again, you know, some examples. And the one that I was going to point out, again, this long in the tooth idea of trends is here's live cattle. And you can see that at this point, uh, we are at a 52-week high, the green box, again, 52-week high of managed money is being long. So what do we know from what we just learned? That over the last, let's say, five weeks, their net position is getting longer. So we're probably going to see price action getting, uh, you know, an upward trend. But then what we can also do is start thinking about where is price in terms of the value for our commercial traders? And so let's do that. So here is cattle. And again, here's our disaggregated. This is our cot disaggregated. And I'm going to go back in here. And again, um, well, let me just do this for a second. See, notice here a green line represents our swap dealers. And yet some market swap dealers can have an effect on it. But normally what you see is a swap dealer's position will be pretty much constant. Um, for a longer period of time. Um, and so you, what we can do is we can take them out of our um, discussion. And then there's those other reportables. So again, so let's look at this from this perspective. And again, what Don is kind of pointing out to us, and this is what we want to look for, is we like to see you know this trending aspect. Again, our money managers are not in this for a short run they're not little day traders they're in this for a while and so we can see since about what is it, about july of last year don right we can see that these money managers have been building this long position right correct and then if we look at where price currently is now i've created this red box here if we look at this in terms of historical perspective well what we're now seeing in the live cattle market is that this trend that has been started since about, um, what was that, about July of last year, has pushed price into a very high price level, historical high price level. And this could be an indication to us that, you know, at this point, our 
price of cattle is probably getting probably a little bit long in the tooth. So what would you take from this um, this chart, Don? Yeah, that's exactly right. Your your red line or is is representing an all time high in uh, live cattle. So you can see this market has moved up pretty much without a decent correction since last year. And it's just, it ran out of gas up here. I mean, managed money again can only buy so many contracts. So when you have a market that comes into something like all time highs or even all time lows uh, in a market, it, at that point, that's a good place to be looking for exhaustion because they, they're probably overextended in their positions uh, and probably maxing out their positions. So who's left to buy in this case? And, uh, and then you tie in something like seasonality up here. This is the time of year where it, that definitely price will start to fall during this period. So that all kind of coincides as well. And then you see the commercials who are aggressively shorting this market up here. And so this would be somebody who's got, the, it could be a feedlot who has cattle in it. Uh, it could be a farmer, a rancher, somebody like that, uh, who just wants to hedge these prices. Because if they feel like, man, you know, come April, or I'm sorry, come fall when I want to sell my cattle, we might not be up here. So they're trying to lock these high prices in today. So what can we take away from this in terms of, let's say we now we see a bit of a price correction, and like you said, they're in for this for a long run. Now, what we do see is that we're not at an extreme high position in terms of historical, in terms of the length or the short positions of our two large players. Right. So how can we maybe use this as looking for an opportunity in terms of re-engaging this trend? That you could do that. It, uh, you what you want to do is just see some of this pressure come off of the managed money for you know maybe a few weeks of profit taking coming down into a significant support area. I mean, just glancing at that when we look back to that like January of 22, there's a peak right there, and that's an old resistance. It could be possibly turned into a support area. And you can see we when we gapped up over it there, pulled back and touched it and took off again. So there's an area if you were looking to get long, there's a possibility of that because by then the, the managed money is going to have less bullish positions in there and now they're you know meaning they've liquidated some of their long so there could be some new money coming in as the market pulls back because remember these guys are long long-term traders are not looking for you know scalping trades right so i see this peak high and then if we do this from a technical analysis right we get a little bit of a gap up well this might be a rollover gap but what i do see here is this is also a jump where we see a lot of new length comes in on this one week, this mm -hmm. impulse. So this impulse here also corresponds where we, you know, we kind of gapped up higher, pulled back, and then broke through this new swing high. So, you know, in terms of maybe as if I wanted to tree, look at an opportunity to re-establish uh, this in, or re-engage this longer trend, you know, that I think that would be a good level as well. What do you think about that? Yeah. No, exactly. I, I, it's a good point to bring up. And, and you know, the, the thing is the managed money, when you see an upsloping blue line like that for the managed money, as long as they're not at a 52-week extreme, meaning a 52-week high in that position or a 52-week low in that position, they are very smart people. And they've got a lot of algorithm style trades, but they're trend followers. So you can use that for an intermediate to a longer term trend analysis uh, that, you know, knowing that you're trading with the managed money. But it's when it gets those 52 week highs and lows, that's when you got to step back and go like, whoa, this is getting a little too expensive or getting you know, way oversold. I shouldn't be chasing the market up here. And, and you got to realize there's following a trend. There's certain times you want to get in it. And there's other times you just want to let it wait, come back and you know, correct. So you get into it because you don't want to be buying the top up here. Right. Exactly. All right. So let's do this. Let's go back to my slides for a second. And. So how can we apply this cut to our trading analysis? So what we did is first we delineated, we said we want to look at these two primary group, our traders, our, our commercials and our non-commercials and who could be leading these market trends. But we looked at um, our 52 week highs, these uh, historical long positions or historical short positions as potential signals of trend changes. And we looked at that as well. Um, we can also talk about, and I know Tom and I have, you know, we, we believe in the same thick process, but I use the terminology uh, open interest and Don likes to use the term um, positions, but we can start to look for when our traders open interest or their positions change from let's say a long or short position. And that's what we're gonna look at next. 
But again, what I want to kind of, as we go through this next segment, I want you to think about this smart money. Is our commercial starting to drive the beginning of a new trend? And then that could signal our trend followers to take, in other words, pick up the ball. Or in the case, what we saw in a couple of examples, are they fading the trend? And it, again, is our money managers um, entering or exiting? In other words, are they uh, adding to their positions or are they taking away from their positions? So let's do the corn market real quick, Don, because I know that's one of your um, favorite markets, but I do think we need to step in and look at a, an opportunity in um, another market. So let me do again, this, this here's our disaggregated, let me take off our two. So Could walk you... us through what, kind of what you're seeing here, because what I see in here is that I see two large players are liquidating their positions that, you know, exiting their trades. And I see a lot of a sideways action in the corn market. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you can see we've gone down, we've got like a negative 60,000 right now on managed money as of last week's report. And while that seems bearish, the bullishness in the way the commercials have been building uh, this long-term position down here, I think if you can put that on a one-year look back instead of three, uh, up there. there we go. And so what we can see is this is the last 52 weeks. And the key on this is looking back to the left and saying, Where's the current price right now? Let's say for commercials and they're minus 199. I say price, I apologize. I mean the uh, scale, but the commercials have a net short of 199,000 uh, positions. But what that means is they're they're still net short, but they still have that's the least amount of bearish bets they've had in the past year. And then as we looked at the managed money, they were just the opposite. They're still bullish overall, but they have the least amount of long positions in the market currently as well. So let we're me, still- Let me put that up. So our, the web page updated and knocked me off of this for a second. Let's do it again. All right, so walk us through again that, Don. I'm oh, sorry about that. Sorry about that, all right. No, it's not my fault. There we go. Um, so again, what we're looking for here is we're, we're trying to find where we're at extremes uh, of the COT report nets positions. As you can see, the red bar down there is at negative 199. So that's at the highest point, meaning the least bearish because they're still net short because they got 199,000 more shorts than longs, but they're, they're the least bearish they have been than at any time in the last 52 weeks. If we look at the blue line up there, we can see that they're the same way, except they're, they're, they just now turned bearish, but they have been long, this market net long. And what we're gonna see on this is the shortest position or least, uh, if you wanna call it least bullish, they have been in the last 52 weeks. We have to be careful with this because cut reports are not that precise. That if we get one week where we just kind of dip underneath of this, it's nothing to come back next week and like that, see how we have an uptick on price action. It wouldn't surprise me this week to see an uptick in there that, you know, somebody else is, you know, somebody's in here buying the corn now. Um, I'm, th I'm, I'm betting once the commercials down here, but if the managed money starts to see buying coming in, their trend following systems won't be long behind that they get long that market again. So we got to be careful not to say, oh, one week we turned down. So we want to see, you know, some more confirmation uh, that the managed money is definitely going to be net short. Which is a good point that um that it's a more of it's not a timing tool right it's we kind of want to let this process go through but this is where i want to talk about this trickiness of these negative numbers when we talk about 52 week highs and this is what don has just kind of brought out to our attention is that you can see we have a green box that says 52 week high for our commercials yet it's still a negative number and what we just looked on the chart was this is the lowest short position that they've had in the last 52 weeks, right, brother? Correct, the, the columns to your left there, where it has 52 week high, 52 week low, you can see the range it's been in. So you can, uh, just to your left, uh, back where, by corn, there you go, see those 52 week high and lows. So that gives you a perspective of where they've come from. So at one point in the last year, they had 768,000 short, net short positions, compared to now they've got say 200,000. So, so there's a lot of room for the price can move and a, a lot of room for our commercials here to add to their positions. But probably sure. what they want to see is corn prices go up between now and let's say in the next, you know, couple of months to mm -hmm. take advantage of like hedging their, their positions. Right. So we really want to see what, what you, what you're kind of betting is you really want to see that our managed money kind of pick up the ball here 
right. and go from a negative position into a positive position. And, and then that, we know the trend will flip. Exactly. But right. you know, with, the, with the commercials wanting the price to go up, remember there's two types. One's a producer who sells, there's a processor who buys. But remember, we're, we're not getting new crop until next December for the corn market, right? So everything now is old crop. So there could be people coming into the market now who need to buy, whether you're an ethanol producer or livestock feeder, because remember, there's not a lot of grass growing anywhere yet, so they've still got to feed some livestock um, and some human consumption. But another big thing is ex exports, right? So you got China coming back online. So that could be part of that buying right now. But the producers are just like, they're drooling at this opportunity going, come on, bring it up, bring it up. Because the higher it goes, they can short at a much higher price for their new crop year when it starts in July. Or not, All right, so let's talk about this inflection where we go from a long position to a short position. We're, we're, see, well, we're waiting for that setup in corn, but here we go back to coffee. You can see that. I mm -hmm. just want to let show you again. Here's my money managers, our trend followers, right, or our trend creators. And here mm -hmm. we can see in coffee is, you know, back in early February, they were net short and their net short position started to decrease. So how does a net short uh, decrease their position, well, they buy. And then they went from being a short position uh, to a long position. So what we're seeing here is a change in trend in these money managers' positions. So what we probably want to see, this might be the beginning of a change in trend for coffee. So let's go to the coffee chart. And again, I'm still in the disaggregated, and I'm going to turn off my swap viewers and my other reportables. And we said that that started about, uh, you know, back in February. And here we are, here's January, February. And this is where we can see that they went from being a short position to starting to buy back their shorts, mm -hmm. right? Well, what happened with price, right? Price got above a level of resistance. So anybody who had been short here is now right under pain right don and then right. what we saw is that price continue to go higher as these trend followers now pick up the ball and and, and run with it right correct exactly yep. well, i think that's a really good example of looking for these changes from a net long to a net short as potential opportunities to find a change in our trend now if we go back a little bit um farther again you know notice where we got these peak extreme positions in terms of a 52 week or uh historical level and those peaking uh price actions but notice that the price action fell as they were liquidating and our in this case our commercials were actually buying you know the whole way down or buying back their shorts and that when they got to uh was roughly around the neg the zero line that's kind of where the market started to go sideways so this is a really another good tool in terms of um as a trader when we kind of get these guys are just flopping back and forth that's also kind of an indication to us that you know maybe this is a time we sit out sit on the sidelines that's right a good now? point, John. Very good point. And if you'll notice where we are right now, how hey, some traders are familiar with something called Bollinger Bands. And remember when they talk about with Bollinger, and these are not Bollinger Bands, but I'm just saying to give you sort of an analogy here. But when Bollinger Bands contract with each other, there's no volatility. So there's really no tr big moves or anything. So people tend to stay away from that market. But when the Bollinger Bands begin to spread, that's when the opportunities for price movement come in. And look what we've done, you know, for the last umpteen was at January, basically. Uh, going back to looking at that, we've been widening out. So the commercials and the managed money, they have a difference of opinion here. And we also see, again, that beginning of that 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 trend, right? Like you said, the Bollinger Bands went from contraction to expansion. But again, what we're really looking at is that their their positions go from a neutral position to an expanding or increasing position. And so one of the right. things when we talk about trends you know, there's a lot of other ways we can look at it, trends in terms of volumes, a way, a way to confirm price. But here's a great way of confirming a trend is by their every week they're adding to their position. So as long, as long as we see our money managers continue to add to their positions, then what we could say is that this trend is still intact 
we could probably see this trend continue on, like you said, for a much longer period of time. Yep. And if, you, if you're looking at this, some of your viewers might be wondering, but if you'll notice there, the, it's like the bar makes a move up and then it goes sideways for multiple days and then goes up again. We're on a daily chart and the report only comes out once a week. That's why it looks like a stair. You don't have to get change it, John. I'm just sort of pointing it out. But but that's why it looks like a stair step fashion because it, it, it reports that Friday report every time. So it's four days where it doesn't move. That's why it looks like that. All right, so let's move on. I want to move on to how we can start incorporating. Since we already just we just talked about that the the commitment of traders report is more of you know a big picture. Can like like you just said, it's a weekly report. We can't really use it as a timing. But how can we can start in, incorporating a technical analysis with our commitment of traders report? And so you know, as I mentioned before, Don writes a lot of articles for us, and and he just had an article, and it came out what yesterday, Don. Yes. You talk about the wheat market. And um, so if you get a chance, you can read it. Don talks about the seasonality, this new crop, all crop discussion. And then he, he's looking at the commitment to traders report. And what the commitment to traders report is telling the Don is that we're getting towards those levels where we're seeing this divergence between these positions between our commercials and our um uh, speculators, but the technicals are not there yet, right? They're right. not right. We're not getting that technical. This is just telling us we need to be aware that something's going on in terms of what the trend has been and what maybe the trend might change to. Yep. So we still need to have technicals to confirm that. Yes, and I was using the head and shoulder pattern there. I thought that was you know one most people are familiar with, but it has to break that neckline in order to give you a verification. What you're looking for is a confirmation to confirm prices turning up. So as you can see today, we actually went down, made a new low. So now we can start looking for a possible double bottom down here. If we come back up and take that neckline out up there around that 705, or to your right there, John, the next little hump to your right. Uh, it, see if we're making a double bottom right now on a daily yeah, chart. Yeah, I said that, but I'm just pointing. There, yeah. So anyway, it right, just right here, anything that confirms is, prices turning up to get the trend followers to kick right. in. That's when we want to get aggressive to get long. So this chart here is a uh, daily chart um, of three months data. And what I have in here is a template. This is a template that Don uses. Um, he uses the 10 and 20 day EMAs. And that's what these two lines here. So what we're seeing here is both of these uh, moving averages are still trending downward. So we're not getting that technical information, even though if we look at this in, from a commitment of traders aspect, we're getting towards those extremes, which we have mentioned before, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So go ahead. Well, I was going to point out, if you brought this up earlier, and it was a great point, is we want to make sure we don't use a COT report as a timing tool. So I know for me, I use it as a screener. So each week I can come in and check the COT report and I look for markets that are getting near these extremes or even confirm trends on my charts with what the managed money is doing if they're not at extreme. So, so I use it more of a screener to give me like, okay, I want to keep an eye on that particular market this week. But let's look at what we see. We see that our our trend followers have the one of the largest short position they've had for the last past yeah. what, three years, right? And what we yeah. see in the wheat is that we see our wheat traders have a positive position or a long position, which we typically, you know, again, we typically don't see. Yep. So that's kind of alerting you, you says in screening you, is that this trend might be a little bit long in the turf and there might be an opportunity to go long the wheat, but the technicals aren't there yet, right? Right. Yeah, but with the aggressive commercial buying down here, it's just a matter of the market could go sideways for a while, and then eventually it will start upticking. And then so once the, uses the, the 10 and 20. So bar chart has what we call as our traders guide, our trading guide, and that goes to here. It, you can find it under our future section. Here's our trading guide, and we use the 9 and 18. So if you think about it, it's, it's Roughly the same what Don is looking at. And this is a trading system that basically talks about when these moving averages cross, I can create a buy or sell signal. And so far, you can see for wheat right now, we're still in the sell signal. So if we're looking for an opportunity to go long wheat, and now that the commitment of traders 
report is telling us we're getting a little bit long in the turf, we still need to wait for that technical indicator. In other words, we'll probably want to wait until this future trading guide turns to a buy signal. Now, I do notice that here, this trend is a little bit on the weak side. That could be a sign of momentum is changing uh, for uh, in the near term. Now, there's other technical tools that we can use as a trader, and some of them you might be familiar with, and Don uh, mentioned a Bollinger Bands, but let me come back into this template here, and I have the 9 and 18 moving average. Let me put that on here, and I also have the Bollinger Bands on it as well. So let's just look at this from the Bollinger Band perspective. What we see is our Bollinger Bands are contracting. That's usually a sign of markets moving towards a sideways action, and we have just kind of gotten outside the Bollinger Band, which is also another indication that if the Bollinger Bands break out, then we could see a continuation of trend. But as, since Bollinger Bands are contracting, it's probably telling us the market is going to consolidate here for a, a, a bit of a time. So what I'm going to do is get rid of the Bollinger Bands, and now you can see our 9 and 18 are getting very close to crossing over. What we might be seeing as Don saying is maybe we're seeing the beginning of a potential double bottom. So there's another way we can start looking at short-term price action, and that would be stochastics and um, RSIs. And so I have uh, another template that takes looks at RSIs, stochastics, and some a, a, a technical indicator that we have, which is called the RSI stochastics, which basically looks at RSIs as a stochastic. And I really like this uh, tool. I've done a webinar on it. And Don, you said you watched it, and you kind of liked how it, uh, ex how I explained it and how smooth. we can use it. I like how it smoothed things out. It, it wasn't so erratic in price action using either RSI or stochastics by itself. So what I see here, you know, let's just look at the RSI for a second, is here we're making a new low, right? We made a new low today but the RSI is not making a new low. So that is what we call a negative diversion. So that would be an indication that we might be uh, bottoming, which is what you said. What I would probably wait for is to get that oversold on the stochastic RSI, excuse me, the RSI stochastic. As it turns positive, that would be a buy signal for me. And you can see right here, this where it turned positive last time also was a signal where we got a little bit of a corrective move in wheat. So there's other technical tools we can use at different time frames. But as Don had mentioned, we're going to use the commitment of traders for it to just kind of just screen these to look for the potential trading opportunities. And then we're going to use these other technical tools to help us with our uh, decision making process. All right, so let's do this because we're getting close to the time. I'm gonna, we're definitely gonna go over a little bit here, and I don't mind this because I think this is really great stuff, Don. I really appreciate you sticking around. So Thank let's you. do this. Go back to my slides. So what's the next thing we can use? Well, we did a little bit of technical analysis. We talked about the different types of report. Well, we can also start using the commitment of traders report to help us find trading opportunities in equities. And I know that it seems like a large stretch, but it really isn't. So what I've done here is I've just, have, this is just a few examples. But for instance, here we have gold ETFs, GLD and the GDX, which is the gold miners ETF. And how we can use uh, the commitment to traders report and this correlation between our commodities and our um, uh, equities. So here we are in gold. This is the April contract. And you can see that our money managers have been starting to build a long position. Now, there was a bit of a correction, you know, last week with what happened with the banks and all. But, you know, they immediately came back in and you have this nice uptrend. So what does that mean? Well, that means that once I've discovered my money managers are creating a trend, then I could start using this information to look at equities that are related to the underlying commodity. So what I can do is I come in here where it says compare, and I'm gonna just put in the GDX, which is the gold miners ETF. And I'm gonna add that uh, to my uh, chart. And you can see there's this high correlation 
um, in this commodity, gold, to um, our uh, equities, how they relate to each other. And so this would be a great tool for an equities trader to look at some of these commitment to traders report, look for these changes where they go from a negative to a positive position as an opportunity uh, to get long. Now, what I will show you too is when we do a comparison, sometimes um, the comparison um, isn't, isn't, isn't as clear. So what you can do is to change it into a percentage. And what you will discover is that in a lot of markets, very small price movements in commodities can create large percentage movements in the underlying equity that has that relationship to it. So let me give you um, a couple other examples here. So Donald, I wanna to go to the grain complex. So you wanna talk about that for a second in terms of some of these ETFs and why I kind of tee this up? Sure. You know, the, the, the ETFs, exchange traded funds, the, they basically, when you get one like corn or gold, GLD, they actually have the physical commodity is what they're trading, or I'm sorry, the contracts, futures contracts themselves. When you're doing something like the GDX, that could be miners. Those are companies. So they're not directly one-to-one um, -one correlation with the physical commodity. Uh, you think about it, I mean, if a company has got bad earnings, bad management, or whatever it might be, then that could be bearish, but the commodity could still be going up. So, But when you do ETFs like corn or USO for oil, those are directly related to the futures market itself. So they tend to be highly correlated. One of the things you run into, though, is something called backwardation and uh, contango, which get you know, a little complicated here. But but if you the a backwardation is simply when the near months are priced higher than the back months, and there's a high demand for that commodity. Those are the best times when you want to use a commodity ETF to purchase those, because then you start seeing those percentage gains, like John just showed you on the gold chart. You can get some really big bangs for your buck on these ETFs when the uh, commodity is in backwardation. But if you're doing a, a market that's in what they call contango and the back months are all uh, higher priced, what that means is every time that the ETF has to roll those futures positions because they use those to hedge them with, they have to buy it at a higher price. So they can't, the change that they're getting every time there's a rollover, they actually lose money on. So the ETF starts to underperform the percentage wise what the commodity is doing. So it, do a little bit more research on backwardation if you decide you want to do the ETFs. But what John's bringing up here, talking about the companies of being able to use those, the backwardation or contango doesn't really apply to that. Uh, however, if you do find a market that is in backwardation, those tend to have strong bull markets in them, but you have to be careful because at some point they, they no longer stay backwardation. They turn back to contango, but it takes a while to do it. Uh, so so quickly, John, here. So I, I just pulled up crude oil, which is usually one of those markets that moves most from backwardation to tangle. And this is what Don is saying is here you can see that the front month prices are more expensive than the back month prices, which is right. an indication of that we're in backwardation. And that would be a better time to use, let's say, the USO ETF versus right. if we were in a time where, let's say, the current prices were lower than the forward prices, that would be a bad time Correct. to be using the USO, right, Don? That's exactly right. Okay, so let's do this. Let's go to soybean real quick. And what I've done here, and again, we're looking at an equity company, not necessarily um, that one-to-one, -one, like we look at the futures as with the GLD. So here we see a ADM, which is Archer's Daniel Minu, which is one of the largest soybean processors. And here's their stock, it's in blue. And you can see, you know, here's, um, uh, the price of soybean over, let's say, this like the last, what is that, six to eight weeks, 10 weeks. And again, small price movements in commodities can have very large. Now, there might be other things that's going on here, right? It, it could be something about exports or the strength of the dollar. Um, but there's this still, again, you can see this correlation between the equities that these companies, these are our commercials. These are the ones that are actually using the, these futures contracts uh, to hedge their day-to-day -day, um, business. But also, we can also see that, you know, when these commodities trend in one direction, depending on wh what companies are using um, or creating, uh, could be detrimental. Think about it like in Hershey's, you know, 
price of cocoa goes up, that could be a bad sign for Hershey's because their costs go um, go higher. So there could be an in reverse relationship between, let's say, a Hershey's and cocoa and sugar and other input costs. So this is a good example. Now I want to go to lean hogs real quick. So I think this is really kind of puts it all together. And here we see this is Tyson Foods again, right? We see that hog prices have gone down, and you know Tyson Foods uh, stock has been in the downtrend with hogs. Now here's our commitment to traders, right? So what do we want to see now? Is is there an opportunity for us to buy this, right? Because what? Our short positions is the historically the sh smallest short position that our commercials have had, you know, on a historical basis. And you can see that there is some correlation between when they get to these small short positions that these could be bottoming opportunities. So yeah, we could look at hogs as an opportunity to buy here based on what we're seeing in the commitment to traders report. Right, but maybe I don't want to trade hogs. Right, this might be an opportunity for me to buy Tyson's food. But what do I want to see? Well, I want to see a change in character of the trend of the commodity. In this case, you know, we're, we're definitely in a downtrend. Right, wait for that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, our bands are expanding, like what Don had said. And you know we're still uh, down sloping moving averages. So what we need to do is wait patiently for the hog prices to create a new buy signal in our futures trading guide, and that might be permission for you to step back into, let's say, equities. In this case, Tyson Foods. Okay. So let's do this. I know I'm a little bit over and I apologize that I do have some good questions done. So let me run through them real quick and then we'll do some takeaways and we'll get out of here. So I know the Fed is about to speak. Uh, so the question um, Ron asks is, does total net positions include all positions across expiration dates? Do you want to take that one, Don? Okay, so total net, yes, it does. That's, you're right, it's the cumulative contracts of the commodity. So there's a question is, um, if these traders are into this for a long time and futures markets have uh, expiration dates, right? They don't have, you know, they don't last forever. How can a trader hold on a position for a long time? Well, again, we talked about spread traders. So a lot of times what a lot of these traders will do is they might be long, initially long the market, but as they get to, close to an expiration, they'll do a spread. In other words, they will sell the contract that they were in and buy uh, the next contract in the cycle of the available market. So how can they continue to hold a position for longer periods of times? Is they can roll uh, to greater futures contracts. But the other thing, when I showed you that example in the crude oil market is that, you know, a lot of traders think about just the front month or the spot month, you know, the currently active trading month. But in futures markets, there are many markets, especially grains and um, energies, where we can trade out multiple years. And so a commercial trader, or excuse me, uh, a, a long time speculator could be buying contract months. Like Don says, they can purchase uh, a, a futures contract that is six months into the futures. You know, you look at, um, let's look at corn for a second. Uh, you know, currently we're in, I think it's the May contract, right, Don? Right. Mm -hmm. And if I go to futures prices here for corn, and I look at open interest here, this is, again, looking at net positions. Here you see December, you know, that is, that new crop that Don is talking about, we already see 260,000 open interest in that contract. So that tells us that there are traders who are already starting to plan on picking a trend or making their bets based on these contracts that are what? This is what, six months, eight months away before we get yep. to them? Mm -hmm. All right, anything you wanna to add to that, Rob? 
No, they, they're just, they're macro uh, traders they're, or investors, if you will. I, I don't want to use the investors in the futures, but yeah, they're macro traders. They're really looking at the very big pictures. So Tom Astor says, he sees, says when the commercials and speculators' positions diverge, this price moves up or depends on the examples we showed. Um, and when they're, when they, when they converge, that price moves down. So it's not necessarily that, Tom, but it is definitely that I think it's important that you recognize that as price, as these positions diverge, that price starts to move. And as they come together, price starts to move. Again, those those trends, a strong trend as they diverge and a weak trend as they converge. Um, All right, so just some geopolitical questions. Wayne, I'll answer that. Come, come in Friday, Wayne, and I'll answer that question. Um, all right, so I think we got a lot. If I didn't get all to your questions, I see a lot of other great questions, and so we are running on a little bit of time. Um, you know, send your questions to bar, support at barchart.com, and, and I'll try to get, get to them, or they'll pass them along to me. So let's do a, one more thing. Let's do a little takeaway, and then, Don, I'll get let you... Uh, go for today. Okay. All right. So takeaway. So the commitment report is not a timing tool. Instead, it's better used as an insight into open interest. But again, what we talked about is that open interest is a way to look at long and short positions. Again, if the cot is a positive, uh, that is a long position. And if it's a negative, it's a short position. Uh, rising and falling open interest or rising and falling positions uh, can be a good indication of a strengthening or weakening trend. That's kind of what Tom was asking. And that we want to kind of concentrate on our 52 week highs and low positions as warnings that there might be signs that a trend may reverse, but also look for those transitions as we were doing that example of thinking about those positions like a Bollinger Band, uh, where they go from a long position to a short or a short position to a long position as a possible starting point of new trends. Our commercials could start a trend, but then our trend followers will pick up the ball and run with it. You want to add anything else, Don? Well, wow, John, you covered that so well, there's not a lot I could say. <laughs> but uh, no, I think again, for me, it, it's something on my weekends, like Sunday preparation for the upcoming week. I love to come in and just check the cop report out. And I tell you the last few weeks of not having that, I felt like I've been trading blind. But um, now that we're getting that back, that is something I like to scan and see, just like you were talking about here, are what markets were maybe at 52 week highs and lows and what direction is managed money pushing the market if we're not at that extreme. So, because I do believe managed money, very bright people, uh, bright traders in there, and they, they really detect a medium term, longer term trend. So I like to keep in sync with that. So I think it's just a good uh, screener tool for me to cut and then uh, bring in technical analysis to confirm when it's time to get into the trade and to manage the risk. Well, Don, I thank you so much for being part of this session today. I really appreciate your insight. Um, I can't thank you enough. And, you know, I want to wish you the best of uh, uh, everything and good luck in your trading. I know that you told me that uh, you're kind of looking for some setups and for some wheat and corn. So, again, Don, thanks so much for coming in by this today. Great. Thank you, John. Thanks for having me and uh, Gene and, uh, and the audience. It was great uh, being here. Okay, so let's just finish up real quick here. So next week, we're going to um, have a webinar on looking at the bear put uh, strategy. And we're gonna take it a little bit of a different tack. Usually this is an income trade, and it is an income trade, uh, but how we can use the bear put option strategy to create income to give us a little protection to downside risk. So uh, if you're interested in options, come on, um, in and enjoy that. Now, you know, we talked about a lot of stuff today, <clears throat> and I will let you know that all of our webinars do end up on our YouTube channel, so you can go back and watch us. If you're watching on in the YouTube channel, I appreciate, you know, a thumbs up and, you know, dropping a line there what you liked or didn't like. Uh, for those of you who are uh, premium members, again, I remind you on Fridays, we have a market and close 
session. We look at some macro ideas, we look at some trending ideas, uh, and then we look for some trading opportunities as well. So come and check us out. If you're not a uh, premier member, well, we do offer a 30-day trial process. You can come in and check out all of these premium tools. And one of the premium tools, Gene is going to tell me that I forgot to tell you, is a futures trading guide, right, Gene? That's correct, John. Yeah. Anything so else? I well, no. Just that if you're if you haven't tried Bar Chart Premier, uh, that free 30 day trial is the best money you can spend right now. So go ahead and give it a try. Yeah, and if you don't like it, we'll refund their money, right, Gene? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed today's session. I know I did. I really loved hanging out with my buddy, Don. Gene, thanks again for a great session. I want to wish everybody out there, be safe out there today with the Fed. Um, make sure uh, you manage your risks, stay healthy, and the good of all trading.